Luke 13, 1 to 9. It says around this time, Jesus was informed that Pilate had murdered some people from Galilee while they were offering sacrifices at the temple. And Jesus said, do you think that those Galileans were somehow worse sinners than all the other people from Galilee? Is that why they suffered and died in this way? Not at all. And you will perish too, unless you repent of your sins and turn to God. And what about the 18 people that died when the tower in Salome fell on them? Were they punished for bad behavior? Were they somehow the worst people in Jerusalem? No. And I tell you again, unless you repent, you will perish too. Then Jesus told this story. He said, a man planted a fig tree in his garden and came again and again to see if there was any fruit on it, but he was always disappointed. Finally, he said to his gardener, I've waited three years and there hasn't been a single fig. Cut it down. It's just taking up space in the garden. The gardener answered, sir, give it one more chance. Leave it for another year and I'll give it special attention, plenty of fertilizer. If we get figs next year, great. If not, then you can cut it down. So in this parable, there's a landowner, a gardener, and a fig tree. And there are two ways that this text is typically interpreted. The first one is really interesting, but it doesn't have too much to do with us here today, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on it this morning. It has to do with the historical context of the conversation that Jesus is having when he tells the parable of the fig tree. It says some people came up to him and shared a bit of news. They said that Pilate, the governor of their area, had just slaughtered some Galileans and their blood mingled with the blood of the sacrifices in the temple. See, at the time, Pilate was trying to build a new water system for Jerusalem because they really needed water. And he decided that to pay for this new water system, he was going to tax the Jewish temple. A group of zealots, deeply committed revolutionaries, they had gathered in the temple to protest and possibly revolt. And Pilate ordered that the crowd be broken up. And in the process, many Galileans were killed. The way that Jesus responds to this is telling. He warns his hearers that anyone who doesn't change their course is going to end up dying in the same way. The same way means literally by Roman sword. So he's talking about this stirring sentiment that Israel needs to band together in violent rebellion against Rome. I don't know if this sounds familiar at all. Jesus says, you don't go up against a global military superpower and expect to walk away without a limp. He actually says, if you live by the sword, you're going to die by the sword. If you play that same game and expect to overturn violence with more violence, you're never going to win. In fact, Jesus has actually come to show them a different way to change the world. And he actually continues by reminding them of another recent news item. He says, do you remember that water tower in Siloam that collapsed and fell on a bunch of people? He says, construction accidents happen. Natural disasters happen. But if the people in Jerusalem continue to refuse God's call to be working towards his agenda in his way, then even those that escape from Roman swords are going to find the very walls of the holy city collapsing on top of them as the enemy closes in. So when Jesus tells this parable, a surface reading is that Jesus is the landowner. He owns the place. And he's ready to cut down Israel, which is the fig tree, particularly Jerusalem and the temple and the ruling priests, the leadership, because they're all missing the point of their special relationship with the Father. And Jesus is saying he's prepared to give them one more chance. And if they refuse, well, historically speaking, in the year 70 AD, Rome destroyed the temple and quelled a Jewish rebellion, just like Jesus promised would happen. 
a lot of people lost their lives and the temple has never been rebuilt. There's another reading though, and it's one that we're probably more familiar with. In this way of looking at the parable, we are actually the fig tree and God is the landowner looking for any signs of growth, looking for any fruit in our lives. Is this tree doing anything at all? And he says, if you don't bear fruit, you're gonna be cut off. You've got one year. Now I want you to think about that for a minute. What does God want you to do? What kind of growth is he looking for in your life? What's the fruit that God expects when he looks at you? And if you had one year to begin to accomplish it, where would you start? This is actually a really fitting question this time of year because we're late into January now and the looming question is how are we doing on our New Year's resolutions? Are we seeing any progress in our goals? Now the Bible uses the imagery of plants and fruit a lot and Jesus specifically mentions this just a few chapters earlier in Luke chapter 6. In a section called the tree and its fruit Jesus says this, a good tree can't produce bad fruit and a bad tree can't produce good fruit. A tree is actually identified by its fruit. You never gather figs from thorn bushes and you don't pick grapes from brambles. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart and an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. What you say and think and do flows from what is in your heart, Jesus says. Now, I don't know what's in your heart, but spend a little while in rush hour traffic and the truth will come out. We know that there's a bad tree in us somewhere because we've all been in a situation where it seems like out of nothing and nowhere, this bleh just comes out in our lives. We all have situations and circumstances certain buttons that can be pushed on us where the worst that's in us is what's gonna come out. We don't have to be convinced that we have that in us. Times of worship and times of reflection, they're all about being honest about this stuff, laying it bare and saying to God, I know that that's in me. But if we're fully honest, we could admit that that's not all that's in there. There's something else too, because we can be loving. It's happened before. We've been selfless, each one of us has. We've been the peacemakers before. We've been the one to simmer down an argument between our friends or our coworkers or our family members. We've spread joy to others. We've brightened up their lives. We can remember specific times when this was the case. We've done the kind of thing in the moment and let the guy next to us get ahead of us in line. We've done it. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. So what's going on here? Am I a good tree or a bad tree? Because good things and bad things both come out of here and here. What am I supposed to do with this lesson from Jesus? What are you supposed to learn about your behavior and its effect on your relationship with your God? Surely this parable is about us and the proper advice that we need to live the right way so that God will accept us and love us instead of rejecting us and casting us aside, right? Isn't that the point of the parable? Well, I know that's how we're tempted to hear this, but the truth is we're not the fig tree. Jesus isn't saying that God's going to cut us down if we don't try harder to bear some of the good stuff. Jesus knows. He just said that good fruit doesn't come from the same place as the rotten stuff, the bitter stuff. Bramble bushes can't just try harder to make grapes. It just doesn't work that way. We read it this way a lot, but the fig tree isn't us. When Jesus spoke, the first time the hearers heard him say this, the fig tree was the geopolitical organization, the nation state of Israel particularly the ruling class and the would-be militias that were trying to make big decisions about the future of God's people. That's what this parable was about. But for you and me, if we want to read a deeper spiritual meaning into this parable, we can. We just have to be consistent with the way that Jesus talks. When Jesus is talking about us and plants, 
He's clear about how things grow. In John 15, he says it this way. I'm the true vine, and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that doesn't bear fruit, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes. He cuts those too, so that they'll be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Remember from last week, that word is, you belong to him. You're his. He's not going to get rid of you. So Jesus says, remain in me as I also remain in you. Commit yourself to me. Be loyal to me the way that I have committed myself to you and am faithful and loyal and true to you no matter what. Remain in me the way I remain in you because no branch can bear fruit by itself. It has to stay connected to the vine, the source of life. So neither can you bear any of the fruit that you're looking for unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you're the branches. If you remain in me and I remain in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, it's not going to happen. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory that you bear much fruit and so prove yourselves to be my disciples. Jesus is the tree. Every time Jesus talks about growth and plants and fruit and growing, Jesus is the tree. He bears his kind of fruit in us and through us, the branches that are connected to him. And we just hang on to him as it happens in us and through us. So what can we learn from this parable then? Well, when we read the parable, who do we actually most identify with? Who do we think like, talk like, and act like in this story? Jesus is the tree. God is the gardener. So who are we? If I'm being honest, a lot of times I sound like the landowner. Listen to the parable again. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard and he came seeking fruit on it and didn't find anything. So he said to the gardener, look, for three years now, I've come looking for fruit on this fig tree and I can't find any. Cut it down. Why should it waste the space in my yard? And the gardener answered him, look, leave it alone for another year. I'll dig around it. I'll put on a bunch of manure. Then if it bears fruit next year, good. And if not, then you can get rid of it. Honestly, we sound like the landowner most of the time. We're the ones that are short on patience in this whole growth thing. We can't figure out what the gardener is up to in our lives. Why is he cutting stuff away? Why is he taking stuff out of our lives? Why is he spreading manure everywhere? What's with all the poop in my life? What's up with this tree? I feel like I've been waiting forever and I don't see any benefit to having it around. I don't see any growth in my life. I don't see any change. I'm tempted to think that it's all a waste of time and that I'm better off without the tree tempted to think that there might be better fruit to be found somewhere else. Is this too vague? Or is someone here getting what I'm saying? Paul speaks directly to our hearts in those moments when we sound like the impatient landowner, wondering what's the use of staying put in Christ and letting the gardener do his work the way he wants to do it when we can't see any immediate results, when we're not bearing the kind of fruit that we wish we were, when things aren't turning out the way that we hoped and we expected. Remember what we talked about last week in Galatians 6. Paul says, let's not grow weary in doing good, for in due season, when it's time, we will reap if we don't give up. In due season, we're going to reap the fruit of the Spirit. Love where there didn't used to be as much. Joy where there didn't used to be as much. Peace and patience and kindness where there didn't used to be as much. Goodness and faithfulness and gentleness where there used to be less. Self-control where maybe there never used to be any. God has planted you in Christ and he's planted his Holy Spirit in you. So let's not be impatient. Let's not grow weary in doing good. For in due season, we will reap this fruit. But there's still one more question. What's the fruit for? 
this fruit that we will bear because there's a good tree planted in us. Why do we want to be any better than we already are? Why do we want to make better choices? Why do we want to have different automatic reactions when people push our buttons? I don't know about you, but I can tell you why I want to be better. And I'm guessing it's pretty similar for you. I want to be better for Aaron and for Eloise and Francis and for Dan and my friends and colleagues, for the people at Mount Calvary that I minister and, and for you, students here at Valley. I want to be a better man so that I can be a better husband and father and friend and teacher and pastor. The love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. This fruit that's growing in you, it's not for you. It's for the people that God has placed you in relationships with and the people that God just brings across your path. The people that feel like God has abandoned them and they desperately need the hope and the love that you have to share. Listen, what you do matters. How you live matters because you are the presence of the living God in this broken and hurting world. Jesus says, we are the body of Christ. So as we seek to, to recenter, refocus, realign our lives around the tree, which is Christ, as we think about all the waiting and all the pruning and all the manure, as we, as we hope for fruit and growth and change, let's remember that the point is people. The harvest is deeper, more fulfilling relationships. The fruit that Jesus bears in us and through us is for them. And when that's your prayer, when that's why you want to grow, Jesus says, ask whatever you want fearlessly and know that he will give it to you. Jesus promises this fruit is your future. So let's not grow weary in doing good for in due season we will reap if we don't give up. Grace and peace to you, my friends.